Good morning and praise the Lord. I am so sure that all of us are and energetic this morning to come together into the glorious and holy presence of the Lord. We know that these are days of instruction, days of sweet Christian fellowship, days of spiritual revival and renewal. And I hope and pray that all of us may be able to go back to our respective assemblies uh, with uh, uh, tremendous blessings which we have received from the Lord, and we may be able to put into practice what the Lord has taught us here in this uh, conference. As I reminded you in my introduction yesterday morning, it is indeed a, a great honor and a privilege for anyone to minister God's holy word. But at the same time, expositional faithfulness and hermeneutical integrity is expected of any preacher of the word. So that is not an easy task. Whenever I stand before God's people, since I am aware of the demand and the requirements for a preacher of God's word to be faithful to his word in observing it, in interpreting it, in applying it, expositional faithfulness and hermeneutical integrity. Without that, nobody should come to the pulpit. So I was very much aware of my own limitations and weakness this morning, and I cast myself upon the Lord, even though I have ministered the word for the last 37 years. I stand before you with uh, trembling and fear, because as we have been singing, he is holy, his word is holy, his people are called to be holy, and our ministry is a holy sacrifice and an offering before him. So what happier thing could we do together than going back to the holy word of God again this morning and speak the things that become sound doctrine? Shall we turn to 1 Peter chapter 5? This is the focal passage uh, for our meditation this morning, even though I will be going back and forth to different verses uh, so that what we read from 1 Peter chapter 5 may be, may be elucidated through the reading and explanation of the other passages uh, we would read. This is the touchstone passage in relation to shepherding in the church. Now, as we have been studying, the responsibility of shepherding is given to all of us. It is not to a particular group of officers in the church. So there is relevance for this topic for all of us. Shepherding in evangelism, shepherding in discipleship, shepherding new believers, shepherding children, shepherding of the parents, shepherding in the home. These are various aspects of the shepherding ministry which the Lord has committed to us. So what we are studying here is relevant to all of us, young and old. But this morning, as I speak on shepherding in the church, it has a particular focus, a greater emphasis on all those who are particularly called and appointed and commissioned by the Lord as elders, as pastors, as overseers over the uh, flock of God. So that is Peter's emphasis in this passage. As I read this passage, I'm reminded of an old slogan of Youth for Christ. I do not know whether they still hold on to this slogan. The old slogan is, geared to the times, but angered to the rock. Geared to the times, and, but at the same time, anchored to the rock. That reminds me that my ministry and your ministry should be biblical, it should be theological, doctrinal, it should be practical, it should be applicational, it should be relevant, and it should be meaningful to the times in which we live. You know, uh, as uh, I go through different stages of my life and ministry, my prayer is that I may become more and more relevant to the generation uh, in which I live. I have to be biblical, 
I have to be theological. At the same time, I should not lose the relevance of my ministry. My concern about our assemblies, I have completed almost 37 years of ministry among the believers who gather into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, generally known as brethren all around the world. My association and fellowship is primarily with them in their company. You know, I'm one among them, and I'm proud to hold to the doctrines which the Lord has enlightened in our hearts. My father preached that over 50 years. But my concern today, my burden, my passion is that whether we as a community, we as a group, whether we are losing our relevance in the times in which we are living, because our assemblies are not having a good track record of growth, effectiveness, and ministry in the world today. Here and there, there is. I travel to Europe, to Africa, to India, other parts of the world. There are pockets of God's people, a faithful remnant whom God is using, who are making impact and who are influential. But generally speaking, that is not the case. And you all know it. And uh, I don't have to explain that. So the Lord is challenging our hearts this morning not to be negative in our approach, but to be very positive and to be excited about God's word and pray and see what are the changes we need to make in our assemblies, in our methodologies. There are definitely needs, a great need for changes to be made. Changes not for the sake of changes, but transformational changes. In the Bible, change is always transformational. It is toward maturity. It is a holistic change. It is a change toward Christ-likeness. So that is the passion of my heart. That is the prayer of my heart. And this passage very much reminds me that even in our oversight responsibilities, there are so many areas where we need to fine-tune. You know, the first car I drove in America, a very used old car, car was a Ford Thunderbird. It had a very frightening look. I don't want to drive uh, a car like that today, but that was the only car I could afford. You know, in those days, so it was, uh, I bought it from one of my friends when we were in North Carolina. I did not know anything about cars. Even today, I do not know anything about cars. In those days, I barely managed to drive it around. I need to used to drink a lot of gas and would empty my pocket, you know. And one day, it was a very old car. And I knew that whenever I drive, it is pulling to one side, and I do not know what was the problem? I took the car to a mechanic. So I was panicking whether I had to buy another car, whether the whole car is breaking down. And he looked at the car, checked the car, and he said, sir, sir don't worry. Uh, your engine is, you know, the engine of the car is perfect. It is very good. You can still drive it for another uh, five years without any problem. But it has a simple alignment problem, you know. And I will fix it uh, probably within 30 minutes. So that was a happy news. And whenever I think about our assemblies, I think that our engine, you know, our, we don't have any engine problem. Uh, we don't have any. You know, all the fundamentals, all the doctrines, praise the Lord, everything in its in right place. We got the best. We got the right stuff. There is no doubt about it. Young people don't hunt for other pastures. You won't get anything better than this, what you have received from the assemblies in relation to doctrine, in relation to the wonderful truth of God's word. But we have an alignment problem. So we are straying a little bit here and there. And my prayer is that the Lord may fix that alignment problem and we will be able to come back and drive straight and may be able to accomplish great things for God's glory. So, may I read to you 1 Peter chapter 5, the first four verses. I'm going to read it from the New King James translation. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder 
and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. We will be spending most of our time in verse 2, but I want to make four major observations about, the, about biblical eldership. Number one, biblical eldership is not simply a plurality of eldership, as we have been emphasizing all these years. Sometimes that is the only thing we emphasize. Biblical eldership is not only the plurality of eldership. It is a plurality. It is not a one-man pastorate. It is not a one-man ministry. You know, the Word of God does not support the one-man ministry system. And more and more evangelical Christians are finding out that the standard normative pattern of church government revealed in the scriptures is a team, multiple leadership. And many, many evangelical groups are adopting the biblical eldership pattern of plurality, which we have discovered more than 150 years ago, praise the Lord. But that is not the only thing. That is my point this morning, because... When we go to an average assembly, and when we talk to believers or even to elders, the only thing we are eager to highlight is that we are not like the denominational churches. We have a plurality of elders. That is only one aspect of eldership, only one aspect. But Peter teaches us more different aspects of eldership which should be held in equal authority and in balance with that plurality doctrine. Plurality doctrine in itself will not help us if we do not couple that, if we do not link that with the other instructions of Peter. Then even plurality becomes irrelevant. It has no significance if we do not connect the dots. So Peter's emphasis is biblical eldership is Pastoral eldership. I want to repeat that. Biblical eldership is pastoral eldership. That means shepherding the people of God. Elders, leaders whom God has placed in the local church, of course they are a teamwork, multiple uh, uh, members, leaders, and plurality. Praise the Lord, there is no controversy over it. We are very clear on that. We can defend it well. But, you know, because of our emphasis on that, now I'm talking from my personal experience which I have found around the world in the assemblies. If you have not found it, I have found it. And that is the reason that I'm sharing that with passion this morning. You know, many people have forgotten that there are other important truths. So I want to make four observations here. Number one is, of course, biblical eldership is pastoral eldership because the imperative, the main verb, the commandment, the major thrust in this past passage is in verse 2. All the other verbs are like Peter uses the word serving as overseers. That is a participle. Watching over, you are overseers. That is a secondary job. It is like the Great Commission passage, the principal verb, the main verb, the main commandment is not going or baptizing or teaching. The main commandment is make disciples. This passage in its grammatical structure is very similar to the Great Commission passage. The emphasis here is not overseeing. The emphasis here is not on plurality. The emphasis here is on Pastoral eldership. Elders need to be shepherds of the people of God. Shepherds feed, 
lead, guide, direct and guard and protect all those things. But Peter's major emphasis is on shepherding. New King James and uh, other translations uses the word shepherd. KJV uses feed the flock. Literally, the verb can be translated as tend the flock. In tending the flock, feeding is the most important thing. That is why KJV translators probably took the freedom to translate it as feed the flock, tend the flock. Tend is an umbrella term. Everything is included in that. Feeding, guiding, leading, everything. And the most important aspect in shepherding, in tending is feeding. So, biblical eldership, what is biblical eldership? Biblical eldership is pastoral, shepherding eldership. I do not know whether you like the word pastoral or not, but I like it. And I am going to use it. It is pastoral eldership. Number two, biblical eldership is a plurality of elders leading the congregation. We all know that. Number three, it is an oversight eldership serving as overseers. They watch over. They have a supervision. Everything is under their control, if I can use that word, in a positive sense. They watch over. They look over. They supervise, they understand, and uh, they lead the people of God. And number four, be examples. Verse three, being examples to the flock. It, biblical eldership is modeling eldership. Biblical eldership is pastoral eldership. It is plural eldership. It is oversight eldership. And it is modeling eldership. And uh, I don't think I am permitted by the Spirit of God just to isolate that plurality aspect only. You know, I think these four things should go hand in hand. Then only we are able to fulfill the mandate for shepherding the people of God. Now, Peter even though he is an apostle, he does not exhort his apostolic authority here, even though he gives his credentials here. And what are his credentials? He is, he is a fellow elder among uh, the people of God, and he is writing to the fellow elders. He is one of the elders, and he is writing to his fellow elders, and his credentials, he is a witness of the sufferings of Christ, that can be a reference to a great extent of he, he being the eyewitness. And at the same time, in uh, another way, he, is, he also witnesses, testifies to the fact of Christ's suffering, to the coming generation, to his uh, apostolic writings. And along with other believers, as he made it abundantly clear in chapter 1, he is also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. And what is the most important thing he has to write to the elders? The imperative, the command. Shepherd the flock of God. The flock is not yours. The flock is God's. So shepherd the, or feed the flock of God which is uh, among you. And I believe if we take the overall context of First Peter, it was written to a group of believers who were undergoing trials and persecution. Chapter 4, verse 12 reminds us about the fiery ordeal, the fiery persecution, the fiery trial through which they were going, suffering and glory. That is the theme of the epistle. And he connects the shepherding duty with that overall theme, I believe. In most versions and translations, not in KJV, chapter 5, verse 1 begins with therefore, or with so, or now. I know that, you know, there are diverse textual readings and variants there, but uh, I am, you know, I am inclined to believe that therefore is a part of the original text because of the context. Therefore, that means 
in view of the persecution through which you are going. And it is at the time of trials and crisis and sorrow and persecution, the people of God need good leadership. That is what Peter is saying. So let us not, you know, uh, divorce this passage from the overall context of the book. Elders, shepherds, you have a great and urgent responsibility because of the suffering, because of the tears, because of the sorrow, and because of the persecution through which the people of God are passing through. You should be there in the forefront to minister to them. And that is what shepherding ministry is all about. It is the cure of souls. It is the care of souls. It is the touch of grace and healing. Our hearts always hunger for, as we have been singing this morning. And the suffering people, people under trial, they need it all the more. And people should be available to take care of them. And I believe that is the context. There can be one more application here, or one more observation. As the church is passing through trials and persecution, there is every possibility that the enemies of the gospel may first single out the leaders and put them in their hit list. And that happens all over the world. First, the leaders are identified and the leaders are persecuted. And if the leaders are arrested and persecuted and discouraged and hindered in their work, then the flock also can be suppressed very easily. That may be the reason, the connective. Therefore, in view of the persecution through which you are going through, I exhort the fellow elders among you, shepherd the flock of God. Crisis days, difficult days, but the chief shepherd will appear and he will give you the crown of glory, the unfading crown of glory. Suffering and glory, the overall theme of the book is tied to Peter's exhortation here. Let me come back to, you know, verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God. Uh, you know, immediately after Peter's restoration in John's Gospel, chapter 21, the last words of our Lord Jesus Christ to Peter, feed my lambs. In KJV, three times, feed, feed, feed. In other translations, feed, shepherd, and feed. You now, two different verbs are used. I don't have time to get into that. But what did the Lord told him in that farewell address to Peter? Peter, I have restored you. You made a mess of your life. But my grace is sufficient for you. I have forgiven you. You know, and uh, the Lord is bidding goodbye, farewell to him. And what were, dear friends, the last words? Shepherd, I fed you with a sumptuous, lavish, all-you-can-eat breakfast this morning. That is how the Lord encountered Peter. He gave him a, a, a wonderful spread, a seafood spread, I would say, you know, with the honey and butter, all those things. And after feeding him well, he said, now you feed, you feed, you feed. So what is the most important responsibility of sh shepherds? It is feeding, feeding the people of God. In our contemporary terms, it is the ministry of the Word of God. That is the most important thing. All other things are secondary. All other things are secondary. You know, if you look at the various verses in the New Testament in relation to oversight responsibilities, responsibilities of the shepherds, it is without exception, it is feeding. In Acts chapter 6, Peter also was present in that group of apostles when there was, you know, a little bit of murmuring uh, in the church in relation to serving the widows uh, 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 food, meals. Uh, in Acts chapter 6, we read about that. What did the apostles decide? They appointed others to take care of that. And what did they say? We should devote ourselves to prayer 
and the ministry of the word. We cannot compromise on that. Our primary calling, you know, they were not putting a garb of superiority complex that we don't do any menial work, that you entrust to others, we are here, we want to be on the pulpit. No, that is how some people would probably look at that. If I say that I won't do anything, my primary calling is preaching the word of God, I do not know how you would respond to that. Now, you know, as I was growing up, you know, I have a, a wonderful memory about my father, many things. A very interesting memory is we used to make fun of him in his older years. And when we also became more, you know, more courageous to face him and to make comments about him. So one day we children gathered around him and we told him that you have never come to the kitchen, you have never helped our mummy, we have never seen you doing anything. So he laughed. He said, you are right. Good observation. And then he told us, children, I know only one thing. And he said, I know that very well. And I'm particular that I should do it well. And he said, you also should be doing that. If you know one thing, he said, I know one thing, that he was talking about his ministry of teaching and preaching. He said, I only know one thing, and I know it well, and I'm very particular that I should know it well. And I still remember that. I still remember that. That is what Peter is telling. Even if you do other things or not, that is not important before God. Feed the flock of God. The ministry, the quality of the ministry of the word of God is the responsibility of the elders. And here also I'm sorry to say that we don't have a good track record in most of our assemblies because our pulpit is wide open to anyone and to everyone. So I'm encouraging you elders this morning in the light and the authority of God's word that you elders should take more responsibility in ministering the word of God. One of the qualifications for being an elder is apt to teach. The qualifications for deacons and elders are almost the same, only one difference, one exception. You know, the only thing that is not mentioned for deacons is the quality of apt to teach, but elders, whether it is apt to teach, whether it is that they should be able to teach. So the teaching responsibility, feeding, that is your responsibility, not anyone's responsibility. Now a practical application of that truth. I want to be relevant and practical. A practical application is the elders who are gifted in the ministry of the word of God, they should take more ministry rather than accommodating anyone and everyone. I know that when I say this, we have perpetuated a wrong pattern in the assemblies world over, world over. American assemblies are no exception. Indian assemblies are no exception. Generally speaking, world over, we have not seen the pastoral emphasis of Peter's exhortation. So we do not have a one-man pastor. We are overreactionaries to other wrong denominational systems. So our pulpit has become very weak. Anyone and everyone, all our uncles and uncles' uncles, all are accommodated all the time. And the flock of God are starving. Don't you know that many of our young people have left our assemblies because they don't get good spiritual food? We have to be alert to this fact. You, you know, we have perpetuated a wrong system. It is, I do not know whether we, whether we can ever redeem it, whether we can, we can change that. And I encourage you, elders, and believers, don't give our elders a hard time asking them to accommodate anyone and everyone. Priesthood and the word ministry are two, two different things. This is another assembly confusion. Priesthood of believers is not preacherhood of believers. Priesthood of believers does not mean that everybody should be ministering the word of God. 
priesthood of believers means that everybody should be worshiping, praising, and adoring the Lord, being involved in good work and sharing and proclaiming the name of the Lord for the glory of God. Ministry should not be word ministry and priesthood of believers are two different things. We need proper alignment, fine-tuning here. Another important thing which I would like to mention this morning is ministry of the word should not be in the hands of one man. It should not be. That's a wrong denominational pastoral system practice. Senior pastor, executive pastor, pastor of assimilation, I do not know what that means, you know. But it, there is nothing like that in the scripture. Ministry of the word should not be in the hands of one man. It should not be in the hands of every man. It should not be in the hands of any man. It should be only, only, only in the hands of gifted men whom God has raised in our midst, whom the elders recognize and encourage and put on the platform to minister the word of God authoritatively to God's people. If we don't practice that, we are not following God's guideline. Harping on plurality itself will not help us. And we are suffering the consequences of that very much. I know our elders have a difficult time in implementing that. I sympathize with them because a wrong system has been perpetuated and they are helpless because if they don't accommodate people on the pulpit, then there will be murmuring. We have to make a strong stand in honor of God's word. Shepherd the people of God. Feed the people of God. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ called the first disciples in John's Gospel, chapter 4, Peter, you remember their name, Peter, Andrew, John, and James. Peter and Andrew, they were casting their nets. And whenever I read that, recently in our assembly, I spoke a message on that. And first time it dawned in my mind that that is probably symbolic of their evangelistic ministry. Casting a net, I will make you fishers of men. Then in the following verses in Matthew's Gospel chapter 4, I believe verse 14 or 18 onwards, he saw James and John, what were they doing? Mending the nets. That is symbolic of mending means if you make a word study with a concordance or you go to Wine's Expository Dictionary and look at the word used there. It is setting the bone straight. It is the word for restoration. The Lord was reminding them, them reminding them, I'm calling you for evangelistic ministry and also mending pastoral ministry. The Lord was giving them a sample of their responsibilities. You will be catching men. They were casting a net, evangelism. They were mending their nets. Mending the nets is pastoral. Mending soul, restoring souls, comforting consolation. You remember, you know, that's why I said Peter's exhortation in 1 Peter 5.2 can be elucidated, supported by numerous references in the scriptures. In Luke's Gospel chapter 22, the Lord Jesus Christ and Peter having a conversation that uh, I, I would like to read that verse and uh, show you something very important there. Uh, Luke's Gospel chapter 22, beginning in verse 31. Luke 22, 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. The first you there is plural you, that he's talking about 
all the disciples. Satan has asked for you, plural, okay, that he may sift you as wheat. But in verse 32, but I have prayed for you, you singular, Peter, that your faith should not fall, and when you have returned after your restoration, what shall you do? Strengthen pastoral ministry. Strengthen your brothers. Strengthen your brethren. Shepherding by strengthening. Peter, that is how I have called you. What a very, very important thing, important truth is that. Let me read to you a couple of verses from Colossians chapter 1, where Paul defines his ministry. It is a word-saturated, word-oriented ministry. And when we say shepherding the flock of God, that ministry of the elders, the primary ministry is to the congregation, to the saints. It is not an evangelistic ministry. Even though at appropriate times they may be involved in evangelistic ministry, the emphasis here is their ministry to the redeemed, their ministry to the saints. Their ministry is not cultural engagement. Their ministry is not cultural engagement. Their ministry is not different activities of interfaith dialogue. No. There are some pastors who spend their whole time in that. What is the emphasis here? You may do all what you can for God's glory. But let me say at your leisure. But if you are an elder, a shepherd of God's people, your primary responsibility is to feed the people of God inside the assembly to the redeemed, strengthening them, confirming them, establishing them, and supporting them. After you have been restored, strengthen thy brethren. Colossians chapter 1. Just only a couple of days ago, this verse uh, forcefully came to me as I was preparing for this morning session. Verse 28. Him we preach, warning every man. So what does Paul do? He preach, you know, proclaim. It is a slightly different verb than he would usually uh, use for preaching. The usual verb is caruso. This is a different word. Him we preach. Then warning or admonishing or counseling. That is another pastoral ministry. Proclamation of God's word. It can be even evangelistic. It can be all-inclusive. But probably here the emphasis is more on instructional preaching. Then warning, counseling every man and teaching systematic exposition of God's word. Every man in all wisdom, with God's wisdom. It is not, you know, he's not harping on his ignorance. Again, I caught my father, he used to say that God does not place a premium on anyone's ignorance. He once told a brother that it is not a credit for you to say that I do not know anything. He was always harping, I do not know, I do not know. So he jokingly told him it's not a credit for you to say that I do not know. You better know it. That is your calling. You know, he was always very forthright and direct in his talk and admonition. All these things are coming back to me. Those weighty words. In all wisdom... That means Paul has to spend a lot of time. He did not do this as a third priority. First my work, second my family, third if I have time, shepherding the people of God. That kind of pastoral oversight is not relevant anymore. I believe in full-time elders. I know it's not a popular concept, but the demands of the time... And the pressure of the time leads us in that direction. We don't have to artificially and carnally do anything about it. We can at least pray that the Lord, we don't have to appoint anyone. 
We don't have to have a salaried man in that position. That's not what I'm suggesting. Every assembly need to pray, Lord, if it is thy will, raise up somebody in our midst who is completely devoted to thee, who can serve us, or even more than one, who can look after the shepherding work. It is so demanding. And I'm getting a feeling that the old type of shepherding in which we believe, it is no more relevant in the world. Because so much need and so much demands, time crunch for everyone, and there is a lot to do. And I'm praying. My family is praying. Personally, when I talk to people, you know, I don't have an easy solution to this problem. I'm not trying to import or implement something radical or revolutionary. I'm making a suggestion, dear brothers and sisters, to meet the challenges of the time, we need to pray. Men who knew the times and who had understanding of what Israel ought to do, as we read in the book of Chronicles. So that is something very important. Paul did that in all wisdom. It is time-consuming, preparing a message, studying the Word of God, visiting someone. You know, it is very difficult to do it along with the job, and we praise the Lord for our elders who have done it along with various responsibilities. You know, they have done their best in the past, and we praise the Lord for that. But we are living in a times in which there is increasing need, and this should be a matter of prayer. So we preach, we warn, we teach. Everything is word-oriented. That's what I'm saying. Then, in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The responsibility is to lead every man. It is repeated three times. Every man, every man, every man, everyone under our care, we should take care of them completely, lead them to Christ-likeness, to the best of our ability, by warning and preaching and teaching in all wisdom, investing time and energy and resources in them. And we may be able to present them before the Lord. And how, do, how did Paul do it? Verse 29 is very humbling when I read it. Very humbling for me to this end. I also labor, make a word study. I also exert myself. I labor, I strive. Striving according to his working or the word is energy. This thing is so challenging, so demanding. I can only do it according to his energy which energizes me in power, to literally translate it. We need the energy from above. It is that energy. It is not my theological knowledge. It is not my seminary degree. It is not my experience. It is not my heritage. All those things can be valuable. The Lord can take and use it for his glory. But after all that is said and done, that is not the most important thing. If you don't have any of these things, don't worry about it. It is his energy that energizes me to do this in power, mightily. And look at him we preach. Who is this him? Look at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him, look at verse 17, and he is before all things. And verse 18, he is the head of the body. In him and in him, him we preach. The very son of God, the very God, the creator of the universe, the redeemer. We are in that business, an intensive people-oriented word-oriented business of caring for the flock of this person, him, who is he? Lord of lords and king of kings. It is to his ministry, it is to his flock. We should have a different approach to biblical eldership. It is not simply 
plural eldership. It is all this. This is our calling. How humbled I am this morning. How repentant I am this morning when I stand before the very word of God. The word of God reminds me that feed the flock of God. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 7, remember those who rule over you. Ah, fill in the gaps. Those elders who ruled over you. What is so special about them? Who have spoken the word of God to you. That is the most important thing about them. Remember your elders in the past. What to remember? Remember the words they spoke to you. So what was their business? Their business was feed the flock with the word of God. Acts chapter 20 verse 28. I think it will be good to turn there. Even though most of us know that verse probably by heart. Paul's farewell address to the Ephesian elders. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Very similar to Peter's exhortation in 1 Peter. You know, Paul is talking to the elders. In verse 17, he called the elders. Okay? Then verse 28, he's talking to the elders. Therefore... Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The elders are overseers. And what is their function? What is their duty? To shepherd the church of God. See, that is the major emphasis in scripture. Shepherding, caring for the flock, feeding the flock. To do it in all honesty and sincerity. I know we are trying to do it to the best of our ability with a lot of sacrifices. I think the Lord is challenging our hearts to go one step forward further. To do more sacrifice. To do more prayer. So that the Lord may show us how we can implement this for God's glory. Feed the people of God. Feed the flock of God. And coming back for the last few minutes, coming back to 1 Peter again, chapter 5, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, that is another responsibility, a pastoral responsibility is pastoral oversight. It is to oversee. Uh, it is to supervise. It is to see that Things are delegated, things are going smoothly, and the assembly can function uh, properly for God's glory. And uh, they have to be overseers, they have to be pastors, shepherds of the people of God. They have to be overseers, and they have to do it uh, voluntarily. They have to do it willingly, not under compulsion. Not for dishonest gain, not for a financial gain, but eagerly. You know, their, their willingness, their motivation, and their manner. Their manner is mentioned in verse 3. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. Those entrusted to you. That is the word entrusted. Or as God's heritage in KJV. It is a good translation because the word entrusted is the word for heritage which Peter uses in chapter 4. You are in chapter 1 verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away. They are the people of God, flock of God. They are God's heritage. They belong to the Lord and they are entrusted to your care. God has set you over them to preside and to lead. So you are overseers. And then biblical eldership demands that elders be examples to the flock. Modeling eldership or leading from living. 
all the previous things, all the things which I mentioned so far, those are actions. The things which we are supposed to do. Then Paul is saying that is not enough. Leading is from living. Modeling, incarnational model of ministry. Enfleshing, your godliness, your commitment, your love for the Lord and His Word. Your servant heart, your shepherding heart. Enflesh that in your daily life. You know, I like that phrase, being examples. That means it is a conscious effort uh, to become an example. I know, Lord, I am not an example. I have failures. I, am, I have mistakes. I have limitations. But in my shepherding ministry, I want to be examples. And then a very encouraging truth. Nobody is going to pay you for this. Nobody even may appreciate it. You elders, you know that very well. Probably all through your life, all what you have received is complaints and criticism. That may even continue as long as we all live in our fallenness. Fiery trials, ordeal, persecution, inadequacy, insufficiency, challenges, pressure of time, not able to do our work, but hang in there. Continue to do it for God's glory. And verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive. He will not forget your labor, your sacrifice, your shepherding, and the time and the energy you put into it. All the sacrifices you made in his name to serve the people of God, to feed the people of God, to spend time in my word. You left everything so that you may learn my word, to study my word, to serve the people of God. I'm going to come and I'm going to reward you for that. An unfading crown of glory. In those days, you know, the amaranth, the flower that was used for making a making a garland or a bouquet of flowers to give to the winner to, a, uh, to make a crown. And they believed that, that amaranth flower, the Greeks believed it is eternal, it will not fade. And later in the Greek language, that will not fade away is a word related to the amaranth flower. But those flowers, those garlands, those crowns that will all fade away. But when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown, a glorious crown that will not fade away. In closing, I would just like to read Psalm 78, verse 72, a verse that has become my favorite verse for the last two years. And this verse energized me and challenged me to write that book on biblical leadership. Psalm 78, verse 72, concerning David, a real good shepherd in Israel whom God raised up. Concerning him, the Spirit of God mentions, Psalm 78, verse 72, so he, that is David in the context, shepherded them, the people of God, according to the integrity of his heart, and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Integrity of heart, that is our honesty and sincerity, commitment before the Lord. Skillfulness of hands is the spiritual gift and ability which the Lord gives to us to lead God's people. We need both. And my prayer is that when I look at our young people, especially my Texas Army here, and all the young people here, you know, my prayer is that in the next generation, the Lord may raise up some of our young people as men and women of integrity of heart and skillfulness of hands, that they may be able to shepherd the people of God in their generation for God's glory. Let us shepherd the flock of God diligently, sincerely, honestly, unto the Lord. 
May the Lord bless us together.